Hold the button. Oh, I'm going to pull this up first. Why it makes you do that? All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint now? Yes, sir. Very good. All right, so before I start, does anybody have any, any specific question about lecture? Did anybody start looking at uh, chapter 21 yet? All right, if you haven't, let's get into that. Technically, what you really should do by the end of the weekend, go through chapter 21 a couple times, and then before Tuesday, at least go through the chapter 19 PowerPoint a couple times, uh, maybe the note packet, try and get those homework assignments completed. That way you'll be a little bit ahead. So when we have class on Tuesday. All right, well, let's get into what the blood vessels are and then start getting into their physiology. Oh, hold on one second. All right, sorry about that. All right, so let's go over some basics about arteries, veins, and capillaries, which are the vessels of the cardiovascular system, as you probably already know. Um, we're not identifying any pictures on the tests, just like last time. There's not any anatomy identification or anything, but we have to know a little bit about uh, these vessels to go through some of their physiology. So first off, arteries are all the blood vessels in the body that transport blood away from the heart to the tissues in the body somewhere. And veins are the vessels that transport blood back to the heart from the tissues. That's how we define them. Um, comparably sized arteries and veins look a little different with regards to the thickness of their wall. There are three layers to the wall of the vessels. They're all called tunica something. So the internal structures are called the tunica interna where there is an endothelial lining and that endothelial lining basically is simple squamous epithelium you learned about in a p one We just call it endothelium and not simple squamous because it's within the blood vessel. So all vessels in the body, cardiovascular vessels, the ones you see on the screen, and even lymphatic vessels, which we haven't talked about yet, basically is lined by this sheet of simple squamous cells just called endothelium. So the main difference between the thickness of the wall of an artery and a vein is the tunica media. And it's pr pr predominantly due to the fact that there's more smooth muscle that surrounds the wall of an artery than in a comparably sized vein. Um, so that smooth muscle ultimately is going to be involved in either contracting or relaxing, which can decrease the diameter of a vessel or increase the diameter of a vessel respectively. So if the muscle contracts, the vessel diameter gets smaller. If the muscle relaxes, the diameter gets bigger. And that has an impact on blood pressure and blood flow when the diameter of the vessels in the body change. And that's part of the physiology we're about to get into. Now, veins also have an added feature. They all have one-way valves except for uh, portions of the superior, the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, but all other veins have these one-way valves because the pressures in a vein are much lower than the pressures in an artery. So the pressures in arteries in the body are, are high, sufficiently high to force the blood to move in one direction. But there are places in the body where the pressures in the veins are so low, if we didn't have these one-way valves that, you know, at certain times, body posture, different things that you're doing or not doing, blood potentially can flow backwards, which we don't want. Um, I know I'm not going to talk about varicosities, but I'm sure you hear, heard about var varicose veins. Varicosities are where the wall of a vein becomes weak and it bulges outward at certain parts. And so the blood just pulls up in that little pocket where the vein is weak and it causes for poor circulation. And obviously the veins get big and we can see them from the surface of the body. And that's why we call it, you know, you can see a varicose vein. Now, capillaries are the smallest of the cardiovascular vessels. They also are the simplest in structure. 
They're predominantly only made up of the endothelium, like all other vessels, and a basement membrane that surrounds it. Now, the, the capillary that we're looking at here is what we call a continuous capillary. I'm not getting into the main differences between the structural aspects of different capillaries in the body right now. So I'm just going to describe them as what we see here, which would be a continuous capillary. When we get to the kidney chapter, though, there's a special group of capillaries in the kidney where the endothelial cells that you see here, they don't specifically touch each other in all parts. So you see here, this is a continuous sheet. All the cells touch each other. There are certain capillaries where that doesn't happen, and in which case there's spaces end up being between the cells, which becomes important for, in that case, kidney function. So what we're going to talk about here now are what capillary beds are and the movements of substances from the blood to the tissue. That, that is to say, when oxygen and nutrients leave a capillary to get out to where the cells are, and then fluids and solutes and waste products leave the cells and then get back into a capillary. That all happens through the capillary wall, and it's called capillary exchange. So basically, it's just the exchange of nutrients and waste products to and from the blood and the tissue cells in the body. And it happens in capillary beds, which look like this, very generic picture. Um, since we have a closed circulatory system, ultimately, uh, everything is interconnected. So the arteries are connected to the veins via capillary bed somewhere. And it, the flow of blood works like this. There's always a little bitty artery, which is called an arteriole, that just means small artery, that carries freshly oxygenated blood and nutrients to the capillary bed. So here's the capillary bed. These are the capillaries over here. So that fresh blood comes in and goes through all the capillaries. What, what they don't show are all of the tissue cells that would be around these capillaries in this picture. So ultimately, when the blood flows through all the capillaries, we have oxygen, nutrients, um, fluid, water, ions, things like that, even hormones that we talked about in chapter 18, medicines you might be on, leave the capillary bed to enter the tissue space and then get into the cells. And then all the cells start dumping their waste products back into the blood. They remove the oxygen, they dump in CO2, they remove their nutrients, they dump in their waste products. And then we always have at the, at the distal end of the capillary bed, something I call the venule drain. So this is a small vein, it's called a venule. And the venules are always collecting the deoxygenated blood from the capillary bed and ultimately returns it back to the heart via the, ven the venule system in the body, all the veins. So these little bitty veins, merge onto one another to form the larger veins in the body that at least some of you identified some of those on that practical, right? You had to identify some veins in the body. We even had to ident identify some arteries in the body. So all the freshly oxygenated blood that's coming into an arteriole to a capillary bed ultimately is coming from the left ventricle. So these would be what is called a systemic capillary bed out in the body somewhere. If this was the pulmonary circuit, the colors would be reversed. So this is not representative of the pulmonary circuit, uh, because if you remember, the pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. And so that deoxygenated blood would go through an arteriole, but it wouldn't be colored red. It would be colored blue because it's carrying deoxygenated blood. Then oxygen would be loaded into the blood via the pulmonary capillaries, and the venule would return the blood back to the heart, to the left atrium, it would be colored red. So the pulmonary circuit vessels, their colors are reversed because of oxygenation and deoxygenation that the arteries and veins are carrying. So this is representative of the systemic circuit. So what we're gonna get into now is what causes solutes and substances to move from a capillary bed into the tissue space and vice versa. And it really happens via three mechanisms. 
Um, a couple of these you learned about in general biology. I'm not specifically going back over them, but I'll, I'll briefly define them. You might remember the name diffusion. Um, you may or may not remember the word transcytosis, but I'll explain that in a second. But the new one for A and P is this one, something called bulk flow. And so this is the bulk flow is, is exactly what the name implies. There's a large volume of fluid and solutes moving at the same time in some direction. So also remember to review all these little links. I don't know if you guys have been doing that from the PowerPoints, but I think they're pretty good. I just left them all in there in case you wanted to view them. So diffusion is the movements of substances down a concentration gradient. So substances will always passively move from where there's more of them to where there are fewer of them. This was what you learned in general biology, right? It's the same mechanism by which ions move that we talk about with electrophysiology. Why do sodium ions always want to move into a cell? If you open a sodium channel, well, there's always more sodium on the outside of the cell than on the inside. So sodium is going to move from where there's more of them to where there are fewer of them. So we call that specifically simple diffusion, but there's also something called facilitated diffusion. And that's where uh, certain transporters help a substance move across a membrane. So again, I'm not going to focus on that. So, but we have diffusion mechanisms. Things can move in and out of the cells down a concentration gradient. Transcytosis involves the movements of larger molecules, but it involves terms that you do know. Endocytosis and exocytosis. You guys remember those names, right? So whenever a cell performs endocytosis, the membrane Somebody gave me a thumbs up. Very good. I still haven't learned how to do that. Um, endocytosis is where the substances will be encapsulated with the plasma membrane, and then the, the little vesicle is pulled to the inside of the cell. So if that little vesicle containing fluid from the outside of the cell moves all the way to the other end of the cell through the cytoplasm, and then performs exocytosis at the other end of the cell, that specifically is called transcytosis. So trans just means through. So the vesicle goes from one end of the cell all the way to the other end of the cell and dumps out the product, whatever it was carrying. So that's just called transcytosis. It involves endo and exocytosis of substances. The new thing is this one. Bulk flow. Bulk flow is the most important of the mechanisms to regulate the volume of fluid and solutes in the inter interstitial fluid, that's a fluid or extracellular fluid around all the cells in the body. So how much fluid is around the cells and what substances are there are important. And, but for also for that matter, the volume of the fluid in the blood and all the solutes in the blood. So we have a larger movement of fluid and solutes that move in some direction. But the driving force to get substances to move via bulk flow is different than diffusion and transcytosis. It actually involves pressure differences of the fluids. So we have to learn four different pressure forces to calculate something called a net filtration pressure. But before we do that, let me show you the movements that substance, substances can take via bulk flow. So the substances will either move from the blood into the interstitial fluid. That is to say fluid and solutes will leave the blood and enter the tissue space. And during those times of movement, that direction of movement, we would call that filtration. So basically the blood is filtering substances out into the tissue space. <clears throat> and that's the direction in which the substances will move from the blood to the tissue space. There are two forces that promote filtration and we're going to learn them. When substances and fluid move in the exact opposite direction, from the tissue space back into the blood, we call that reabsorption. 
So when solutes and water is moving from the extracellular fluid around all the cells back into the blood, we just call that reabsorption. So we reabsorb to the blood, we filter from the blood, if that makes sense. All right, and I put the, the forces in here that promote both of those here, but I'm gonna teach it from this picture. So this picture represents uh, very simply a capillary bed. You see one end is red on the picture, one end is blue. Um, so this would be the arterial feed into the capillary bed. That is to say, the freshly oxygenated blood coming in, the cells would lie on the outside of the capillary somewhere out here. The cells take out the oxygen they need and the nutrients that they need and they're dumping in their waste products the whole time. By the time the blood reaches the end of the capillary, this is the venule drain of the capillary, which we always color blue because the cells took out some oxygen. Now at rest, while you're not physically active, the cells do take out oxygen that they need, but the oxygen need at rest is fairly low. So when the blood is leaving a capillary bed and what we call deoxygenated blood through the venule, it actually is still saturated with oxygen up to 75%. So we're gonna learn that in the respiratory chapter, but at rest, we, our cells really only need about 25% of the oxygen that the blood is carrying. So let's look at how the fluids and solutes move, all right? In order to determine the direction in which fluids and solutes will move via bulk flow, we have to calculate something called net filtration pressure, right here, NFP. Once we learn how to do the calculation, you do a calculation. Once you do the calculation, you're gonna come up with some number, whatever the number is. If the number is a positive number, after we do the calculation, it means you always have filtration occurring. So if the net filtration pressure value is a positive number, you always get fluids and solutes moving out of the capillary. That's called filtration. If, however, we run the calculation and the net filtration pressure is a negative number, we always get fluid and solutes moving back into the blood, and that's called reabsorption. Now, in order to do the calculation, we have to really know two things. What are the forces that will promote filtration relative to what are the forces that will promote reabsorption? It's that simple. And once you take all the forces that try to promote filtration and you add them together, you're gonna to subtract that number from the total number of all the forces that try to promote reabsorption. So basically the net filtration pressure value is nothing more than the filtration force minus the reabsorption force. That's how simple it is. Now where students get kind of confused with it is because the four forces have these weird names. They're kind of weird. But if you try to keep it simple, it, it, it really is simple. So what forces promote filtration? Okay, these. Let's subtract all of those from all the forces that promote reabsorption. And do you get a positive number or do you get a negative number? It's that simple. If you get a positive number, you always filter. If you get a negative number, you always reabsorb, okay? So let's go over the forces then. There are two forces that promote filtration. The largest of the forces is actually the blood pressure that's in the ar arteriole and into the capillary bed. And that blood pressure value is called the BHP, the blood hydrostatic pressure. That's what that's called. So this is the largest of the forces. It typically, in a healthy individual is also the only force out of all four of them that will actually change its value from the arterial end of a capillary bed to the venule end of a capillary bed. 
all of the other values in a healthy person stays the same. So <clears throat> the driving force for filtration basically is basically blood pressure. So what is the blood pressure at the arterial end of a capillary bed? Well, on average, it's 35 millimeters of mercury of pressure. Oh, and you don't have to go memorize these numbers. I'm gonna give you some numbers on the test. I'll give you the numbers. You don't have, don't waste your time memorizing num these numbers. The more important thing is to understand how to calculate it, all right? So basically the driving force for filtration is just the blood pressure, the blood hydrostatic pressure, because the other force that tries to get fluid to come out of a capillary is not a hydrostatic pressure, which is always a pushing force, by the way. It's something called interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, the IFOP. This interstitial fluid osmotic pressure is basically a pulling force. It tries to pull fluid out of the capillary bed into the tissue space. So osmotic forces are actually pulling forces. Hydrostatic pressures or forces are always pushing forces. All right, so now that we know the two forces that try to promote filtration, all we have to do is add them together. And as it turns out, the interstitial fluid osmotic pressure is a very low value. In fact, we can almost not measure it. It's about one millimeter of mercury of pressure in a normal individual. That doesn't take into account severe edema. If there was a large volume of fluid out here, that would be different. But in a healthy individual, this value is one. So to calculate the total filtration pressure, all we have to do is add 35 and one. And obviously you come up with 36, right? So at the arterial end of a capillary bed, the total pressure that tries to promote filtration is 36 millimeters of mercury of pressure. And so that's what you would put in the first little parentheses, 36, right? Now, what is the reabsorption pressures then? Well, the reabsorption pressures are these. The, for, the largest of the forces that try to promote reabsorption is actually a pulling force from within the blood itself. It's an osmotic pressure that's just in the blood. <clears throat> Again, in a normal healthy individual, this osmotic pressure stays about the same. We don't want it to change. So this osmotic pressure is called the blood, <clears throat> the blood colloid osmotic pressure, or the BCOP. The BCOP, blood colloid osmotic pressure, is a pulling force from within the blood itself. So it's trying to draw fluid and solutes back in. Now, the other force that tries to promote fluid and solutes to come back in is actually a hydrostatic pressure. The hydrostatic pressure that's out in the tissue space directly is called, which is a pushing force of water, by the way. That's what hydrostatic pressure is. This would be called the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, IFHP. So this basically is a pushing force of the water that's already out here in a tissue space. Again, in a normal healthy individual that does not have severe edema, the pushing force of water from out here is so low we can't even measure it. So it's taken to be zero. So all you have to do to calculate how much force tries to draw fluid back into the capillary bed is add together the blood colloid osmotic pressure, which is 26, plus the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, which lo and behold is just, well, zero. So the total force that tries to get fluid to come into a capillary is just 26 at the arterial end of a capillary bed. So if we go down here to the calculation, remember what we're doing is we're taking the total filtration force, which is 36, and we have to subtract from that the total reabsorption force, which is just 26. So if you subtract 26 from 36, you get a positive 10 millimeters of mercury of pressure. 
Not too bad, right? Simple sub, uh, subtra adding and subtraction. So since we end up with a positive number at the arterial end of a capillary bed, all of the capillaries at more towards the arterial end are trying to get fluids and solutes to go out to the cells. But that changes once the blood reaches the venual end of a capillary bed. And again, the only value that changes out of all four is the blood pressure. The blood pressure continuously drops the further from the heart the blood goes. I didn't tell you all that when we covered the heart in lab, but, or in, in here either, I forgot. But the farther the blood gets away from the heart, the pressures keep dropping. So as we go from the arterial end of a capillary bed where the, the blood pressure is 35 millimeters of mercury or pressure, by the time we get to the venual drain, the blood pressure is only 16. So the blood hydrostatic pressure at the venual end of a capillary bed is about half that at the arterial end or so. So it's only 16. So now at the venual drain, we rerun the calculation. So what are all of the forces that try to promote filtration again? Well, blood pressure and interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. So if you take 16 and you add that, which is blood pressure, you add that to the interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, which is again, just one, you end up with 17. So you put that in your little parentheses down here. So the filtration pressure is always going to be first. So that would be at the venual drain of a capillary bed, the filtration force is only 17 millimeters of mercury pressure. Relative to the reabsorption force, which really doesn't change because the reabsorption force is nothing more than the blood colloid osmotic pressure. And as long as someone is not in liver failure, this number is not going to change. So we can't go through the pathophysiology of that right now. But so this number in a normal individual stays the same. So even at the venual drain of a capillary bed, the, re the reabsorption force is 26. So all we have to do is put that in the reabsorption parentheses in our calculation. Now, if we subtract 26 from 17, you end up with a negative number. So at the venual drain of a capillary bed, the net filtration pressure is actually a minus nine millimeters of mercury of pressure. And being a negative number, it automatically tells me that we're going to reabsorb. So this is the normal movement in a capillary bed. This is the textbook case that you see right here. We always have more filtration at the arterial end of a capillary bed. We always have more reabsorption at the venual drain of a capillary bed. And so on the test, I'll have a question or two on how to calculate net filtration pressure. So basically you have to know the formula. What are the forces for reab uh, filtration? And you know you have to subtract from that the forces that promote reabsorption. That's all it is. So even in your notes, if you want to write, oh, look, it already has it here. Pressure promoting filtration. That's th this in parentheses. Pressure promoting reabsorption. That these in parentheses. And it's that simple. Don't get lost with these weird names. I mean, you have to know the name, but it's we're only going to have a question or two. We have more important uh, things to tackle in the chapter than this, but we do have to understand it. So just make sure you go through that. If you end up having a problem with the, the calculation, just email me. I think that's something we can do via email or, you know, a quick question next time. So I'll put the formula here as well so you can see it all laid out. Uh, just review that. All right. Now we need, we need, we need to start getting into the physiology part the factors that actually affect blood flow through the body. <clears throat> and there are basically two main factors that affect blood flow in the body. And it involves our uh, cardiac output, which we covered in a heart chapter. We're going to look at that a, a little bit again here. So how much blood the heart pumps out every minute is important. And then a new factor or several of them we're going to cover in this chapter factors that lead to the resistance of blood flow in a vessel. So there are two principal factors, if you want to boil it down and make it simple, that affect our blood pressure and blood flow. And they are cardiac output and resistance. 
So we're going to get to that. So what is a total blood flow that can go through a tissue in the body? Or in other words, how much blood moves through a tissue in the body? Well, it's pretty simple. The amount of blood flow that moves through a tissue in the body is equal to how much blood the heart is pumping out. Now that can change slightly depending on what's going on in your body. That is to say, with some of the new factors we have to cover. And it's terms that you really already know, vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So ultimately there are certain areas in the body, if we vasoconstrict heavily, you're really gonna decrease blood flow through that tissue because you're, you constricted all the vessels to it. But then at another tissue, if you vasodilate, the vessels are larger, more blood volume can get to that tissue. So in general, the amount of blood volume per minute that gets through a tissue is cardiac output because cardiac output, which you remember is heart rate times stroke volume, is the total blood volume that your heart pumps out in one minute. And so that's going to be important. So here I put another animation. I think it's a pretty good one. Just an overview of vascular regulation and what we covered in chapter 20, cardiac output. And we're going to cover that in a minute as we go through uh, some of these other factors. All right. So what is blood pressure? Right. I mean, we, we heard of the term before blood pressure, but what is blood pressure? You know, you can take the pressure as two numbers. You got a top number, they got a bottom number. I mean, what is the pressure, right? Well, blood pressure is a force. It's the force that's exerted by blood against the inside wall of the vessel as blood is moving through the vessel. So to make it a little simpler, Basically, it's the force that blood is pushing on the wall of a vessel. So what generates that force anyway, right? Well, it's the ventricles. Remember from chapter 20, when the ventricles contract, it generates a high enough pressure to make the semilunar valves open during isovolumetric contraction. Uh, rela uh, contraction. Those semilunar valves open and we get ventricular ejection. Well, where's the blood go? Well, from the right ventricle, the blood goes into the pulmonary trunk. From the left ventricle, the blood goes into the aorta. So the actual pressures that are generated come from the contraction of a ventricle, not the atria. So that's why we have really two pressure numbers for blood pressure. There's always a top number. There's always a bottom number. The top number, obviously the highest pressure generated is the pressure that's generated during ventricular systole. While the ventricles are contracting, it generates this pressure. And that's why we call that the systolic pressure. It's the pressure that's generated when the ventricles are contracting. But there also is a pressure in our arteries when the ventricles are relaxing. It's just that the pressure drops a little bit down here. So what is the pressure in the artery while the ventricles are in their relaxation period? Well, that's the diastolic pressure. So we always have systolic, diastolic, systolic, and diastolic, right? Now, um, I didn't write that formula on here. We should know how to calculate mean arterial blood pressure. So I'm gonna write that out again in a second, but let's go through this. So blood pressure is actually determined by more than just cardiac output. That is part of it. The, the force of ejection of blood in the vessel while we're contracting and the force of blood while we're relaxing is important. But also how much blood volume is in the actual blood vessel is important or in the system. And then lastly, what we're covering in this chapter is vascular resistance. How much resistance does the blood vessel afford to the moving blood? So resistance is the opposite force to blood pressure. Blood pressure is the force exerted by the blood to the wall of a vessel, whereas resistance is the force of blood exerted from the wall of a vessel back to the blood. So they're opposite forces. So there are three main things that contribute to the blood pressure and how we can change blood pressure, and that's what we're kind of going to learn. All right. Now, let's look at uh, this form. See if I can write it in here. I don't know if it'll let me. <clears throat> 
Oh, it won't let me while I'm sharing my screen, will it? There it goes. How come I can't? Oh, here we go. Let me click here. We should know the uh, mean arterial blood pressure formula. I think I gave it to the people in the lab. I'm pretty sure we did that. But if you didn't cover it in your lab, uh, we should know that. So mean arterial pressure, or did I do that already? Did we do this already? That was in lab though, huh, Leslie? We didn't do that in here yet, did we? Oh, it was in lab, okay. All right, so uh, the mean arterial pressure is going to equal something called pulse pressure divided by three plus the diastolic pressure. Now we just have to figure out how to calculate that and what all of that means. Well, pulse pressure equals systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. And the systolic pressure basically is the top number of your blood pressure. That's the systolic pressure. So if we know what this pressure is, to find the pulse pressure, all we have to do is subtract the systolic pressure from the diastolic pressure. And that gives us pulse pressure. So if you take the pulse pressure and divide that by three, and then just add back the diastolic pressure, then you get mean arterial pressure. Now this is an estimation calculation, but it's, it's fairly close to being true. There's more accurate measurements of this, but this is what we typically we, we do. So if we had the systolic pressure equal to 120 millimeters of mercury of pressure, and we had diastolic pressure equal the uh, 80, that's a textbook, right? Pressure. Then we do this calculation, we would get the mean arterial pressure equal basically 120. I can't right now, can I see? I, I have like 120 minus 80. Where is that? There it is. So you got to do that first. Once you do that, you divide by three and then you add back 80. Right? Great. I think I just lost connection. Can y'all hear me now? Yes. All right. I lost connection. I got bumped. Let me go back. All right. Can you all see me now? All right. Yes. I got the thumbs up. All right. So let's just start over. We have to know that systolic pressure is 120 or whatever the, whatever the value is. And the diastolic pressure is 80. So to get the pulse pressure, just subtract these two numbers. It's that simple. So you subtract this first, you get 40. You're going to divide 40 by 3, and I forget what that comes out to, like 13.3 or something. I forget. And then, and then you add back the diastolic pressure. So that should equal somewhere around 93.3 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So again, don't memorize these numbers. You have to know this formula up here and how to get pulse pressure, of course. And so I'll just give you some simple numbers for that. So I, did everybody write this down that I just wrote in? Because it's not going to be in the PowerPoint that's in Canvas. Because I would have to save this and take the other one out and reload this in. So if you didn't, all right, I got another thumbs up. Very good. All right, so just know the formula. I think I only have one question on it anyway. So, but we should know what mean arterial pressure is. And I know I'm kind of rushing through some of this stuff, but I really need to get to our physiology where I'm going to have the majority of our questions, which is going to start here. So let's talk about vascular resistance. So blood pressure in our body um, can be altered if we alter one of three things. You can change your cardiac output, which does change, right? It's lower when you're resting and it's higher when you're working out. We talked about that. Um, you can change your blood volume and you can change resistance. So we have to figure out what resistance is and how we change that. So ultimately resistance is again a force. It's the force that the blood vessel is pushing back against the moving blood. So basically your heart and with something called local uh, regulation, we have to generate enough force of blood pressure to move the blood through 
the vessel that's trying to block the blood from moving through it, if that makes sense. There's an opposite force that's pushing back against the blood. So ultimately, anything that makes the resistance go higher automatically makes the blood pressure go higher. It has to, or your blood is going to stop moving. So we don't want that to happen. If that happens, that's called circulatory system collapse. And that can happen in severe, severe dehydration, where there's not enough blood volume for the heart to move the blood through the vessels. And we're going to talk about hypovolemic shock briefly at the end, if I can get to it, or I might have to just get into it a little bit next time. All right, so there's three different factors that affect resistance. The size of the blood vessel, basically what is the diameter, right? Um, if it's small, the resistance is high. If the vessel diameter gets bigger, the resistance goes down. I'm gonna tell you that again in a second and how we control that. So this first parameter right here, vessel diameter really, the size of the vessel is the most important physiologically that we regulate to control and change resistance and thus blood pressure and blood flow. This is the one that our body physiologically changes very quickly in order to either increase pressure or decrease pressure. And if we can increase pressure, we can increase blood flow th to a tissue at certain times. We also have the thickness of the blood, which is viscosity. Now the viscosity of the blood, we don't want changing. So it stays about the same in a healthy individual. However, if you start to get dehydrated and you start losing your water out of your blood, either because of severe vomiting and diarrhea if you're sick or severe sweating and you're not replacing fluids and electrolytes, your, the thickness of your blood goes up. And so as the thickness of blood goes up, the resistance also goes up. An easy way to think about this one, I think I'll always use this analogy. If you take a straw and try and suck syrup up through it, it's harder to get the syrup to move through the straw than if you're sucking water up through a straw. Obviously, syrup is more viscous. So if we increase viscosity, you increase resistance, which would increase pressure. Also, the total length of blood vessels means something. Now, this we don't change physiologically. This happens with body growth. And this really only comes into play in people who start to become obese. Um, specifically, if you see people, I don't know if you've ever seen people that have uh, these uh, genetic abnormalities where they get morbidly obese. It's really, really in those individuals where they have a major issue with hypertension. So their blood vessels grow, keep growing and growing and growing with the massive amount of tissue that they keep growing and it makes their blood vessels longer, which means the blood meets more resistance in the vessel, which means the heart has to generate more force to move the blood, which means their blood pressure is higher. So, which is obviously a problem. We know high blood pressure is an issue, right? All right, so we're gonna look at these parameters again in a second. Let's talk about venous return that I've mentioned before. And now we have a little picture to show what it actually is. So venous return is basically the volume of blood that returns back to the heart from the body. It's that simple. How much blood and how quickly does that volume of blood reach the heart from the body mean something? And so venous return is assisted by the heart itself. Obviously, the heart is pumping. But we also have some other mechanisms by which we can ensure the blood returns back to the heart. Obviously, va uh, veins have valves in them, which I mentioned before. So there's one-way valves in the vein. When you work out, your muscles squeeze on veins, which squishes the blood through the vein quicker. From one section of one set of valves to the next, very quickly, ultimately pu pushing the blood back to the heart more quickly. Also, when you're working out, you breathe faster and deeper. So when you increase your respiratory rate and the depth of breathing, you're changing pressures in the thoracic cavity, which squeezes on the veins in the thoracic cavity. So the bottom line is, if you can squeeze on a vein, it increases the pressure of the blood in the vein, 
and it opens the, the other end, the, the, the one-way valve opens at the other end and the blood is squished to the next section of the vein. So if you're working out, and here they show what's called the skeletal muscle pump. This is an accessory pump for blood flow. So your muscles, when you work out, actually helps your heart return blood back to the heart. That's called the skeletal muscle pump. We also, this would happen also in your thoracic cavity, but not more so from muscle squeezing on the veins, but from the thoracic cavity pressure differences from you breathing. All right, so let's go into another parameter, which is the velocity of blood flow through a vessel. How fast does a blood move through a vessel? And as it turns out, this is what we call an inverse proportion. And what an inverse proportion is, is that first of all, a proportion is a comparison of two different things. And it's this simple. If I say that A, is directly proportional to B. What that means mathematically is that if the value of A goes up, then the value of B must also go up. That's what we would call a direct proportion. So let's say the value of A is one and the value of B is one. If they are directly related, if the value of A goes to two, then the value of B is going to go to two. It's that simple. Now in an inverse proportion, which everybody knows what it is already, because if I could write it out on the screen, you would know what it is. It basically is a fraction. It's one over something. That's an inverse. One over something is an inverse. So if I say that A is inversely proportional to B, Mathematically, then, if the value of A goes up, then the value of B must go down by the sheer nature of the math. It's 1 over B, which is an inverse. So that's what the velocity of blood flow is. It's inversely related to the cross-sectional area of a vessel. Now, we're not going over the geometry of calculating the cross-sectional area of a circle. I'm not doing that. That's for your geometry class. So I kind of make this a little bit more simple, which is mathematically incorrect, but since we're not calculating the math, I'm not that concerned with it. So the, the cross-sectional area of the vessel is basically how big the diameter of the vessel is and all the space in between in that circle that the blood can move. So if we have a larger surface in that diameter, that since the cross-sectional area of the vessel goes up, that means then the velocity of blood flow must go down because they're inversely related. So another easy way to, to think about this parameter is this. If you take your garden hose and take your nozzle off of it and turn the water on, the water comes out your hose just in big globs of volume, but not very, it doesn't spray very far, right? It just kind of out the end of the hose. But if you then take that nozzle and screw it onto the hose and pull the trigger, the water shoots out long distances under higher pressure, right? Faster. Why is that? Because you essentially made the cross-sectional area of the hose smaller by putting your nozzle on it. So if the cross-sectional area goes down, the speed or really velocity is a little bit different from speed. That's for your physics class. But the, the speed with which the fluid moves is faster. So look at this picture. This, the reason why I'm saying this is because everybody gets confused on this. Look at the cross-sectional area of the aorta. Okay, so that's the green line, by the way. We all know that the aorta is the largest artery in the body. So it's got a pretty big opening, right? But then if you look over here at capillaries and venules, these happen to be the smallest vessels in the body. So how in the world can the cross-sectional area of the capillary be so much greater than the cross-sectional area of the largest artery in the body? Well, it's simple. You only have one aorta, but you have trillions of capillaries.
So basically, this represents the cross-sectional area of every single capillary in the body, which happens to be much greater than the cross-sectional area of just one aorta. So look what happens as the cross-sectional area goes up. The velocity of blood flow goes down. It slows down to a crawl, in fact, in a capillary, in a venule. Now, the reason why this is so important, this concept, when the blood leaves the left ventricle, the pressure and the force is the highest. Boom, with ventricular ejection. So the blood's going the quickest and the pressure is the highest. But if that force and that speed with which blood is leaving the ventricle was in a capillary, the capillary would explode. Wouldn't do us any good. And it also would not give us enough time for capillary exchange to occur efficiently. So as the cross-sectional area of the vessels in the capillaries and venules go way up, the velocity goes way down and it slows the blood flow down to such a degree that we have plenty of time for capillary exchange to occur. So that's the importance of this chart right here. Know that if the sectional area goes up, the velocity decreases and you have it down pat, all right? All right, now this is a summary chart. This is a summary chart that sums up all of the parameters that affect cardiac output, which we covered in chapter 20. And it's a summary chart that sums up all of the factors that regulate systemic vascular resistance. Now for everybody in lab, this is called total peripheral resistance. But basically, it's the same thing. Technically, SVR is the resistance in the systemic circuit. Total peripheral resistance is the same thing, just under a different name. So often, you'll see this on my test. So at least in lab, if you see TPR, it means the same thing. So look what happens with our blood pressure down here. Our mean arterial pressure, and from now on, I'm just gonna say blood pressure. Our blood pressure basically is affected by two main things. Cardiac output, how much blood the heart pumps out every minute, and what is the resistance in the vessel? So if the resistance can go up, the pressure would go up. If the cardiac output goes up, the pressure goes up. That's how that works. So let's go over cardiac output briefly again, and then go over the new parameters in this chapter. So you know cardiac output already is dependent upon two factors, heart rate and stroke volume. If your heart rate goes up, cardiac output goes up. If stroke volume goes up, cardiac output goes up. But what controls them, right? Well, heart rate is predominantly affected by the autonomic nervous system and hormones specifically from the adrenal medulla, the hormones. So the sympathetic system dumping out norepinephrine makes your heart rate go up. If we have the parasympathetic system firing, it releases acetylcholine, which makes your heart rate go down. Stroke volume is affected by how much blood returns back to the heart. And that would either increase the force of contraction of the ventricle or decrease it. So if we can increase the force of contraction of a ventricle, the stroke volume would go up, which makes cardiac output go up. So what controls that then? Well, whoops, sorry about that. What controls how much blood gets back to the heart? Well, how much blood volume we have means something. And this is where your blood volume comes into play. This is why blood volume in your patient is directly related to their blood pressure. So you have a patient that's dehydrated, their blood pressure is gonna be low. The first thing you do on them, which I mentioned before, you hang an IV bag on them. You wanna re-infiltrate fluid and solutes, rehydrate them. So what does that do? It expands the actual volume of the vessel because you're putting more volume in there. So if you're putting more volume in there, obviously you have more volume to return to the heart. So that's where blood volume comes into play. On the other hand, if you decrease volume, like severe dehydration, your venous return goes down. If your venous return goes down, your stroke volume goes down. 
which makes your cardiac output go down, which makes your blood pressure and your blood flow goes down. And that's why severe dehydration can kill somebody. And then you have to rehydrate them, which we're about to talk about. So then we have the accessory pumps I just mentioned, vasoconstriction, and also something called venoconstriction. Venoconstriction is just vasoconstriction of a vein. That's all. So if you, if you vasoconstrict or the veins can really constrict the veins, that can increase pressure in the vein, which helps return the blood, all right? So let's get to the new parameters. There's three basic parameters that affect resistance. Viscosity of the blood, which we don't want to change. We want this to stay the same. So physiologically, we don't regulate this one. But if viscosity goes up, resistance goes up, and your pressure would be higher than normal. This is bad over time. We don't want that to change. Um, and this happens during dehydration, uh, where the volume of blood goes down, but the solutes goes up, so your blood gets thicker. That's the one I just mentioned. Or you can have too many cells per unit volume of blood. That's called polycythemia. That happens in certain conditions, which we're not covering. So this is more of an abnormal condition. In a normal individual, we want this to stay about the same. It's, and the normal viscosity is just a little bit thicker than water. It's not as runny as water, it's just a little thicker. Also, we don't change our vessel length physiologically. That happens over time with, with our growth of our body. And that severe obesity, morbid obesity, that is where we really see the problems with this. The vessels can get so long that the heart has to generate so much force to overcome the increased resistance that our, their pressures are always a lot higher. So as the vessel increases length, resistance increases, and the pressures go up. So really, physiologically, out of all of these parameters, the only one that's important is this one. What is the diameter of the blood vessel means something. So obviously you see in this box, it says the vessel radius. Now, the reason why it says radius is because in order to calculate the resistance due to a change in the blood vessel size and diameter, the mathematical calculation uses the radius of the vessel, not diameter value. So since I'm not making you do the mathematical calculation, I just want you to know the physiological ramification of what happens. But for those of you that want to go calculate it, you can. This is an inverse proportion. That is to say, if the vessel diameter decreases, which is vasoconstriction, then resistance goes up. I'll say it again. This parameter is an inverse proportion. If the diameter of a vessel decreases, gets smaller, vasoconstricts, resistance goes up. If the vessel diameter gets bigger, as in vasodilation, resistance goes down. So the actual calculation for that uses radius value, which is half of the diameter, and the formula is one over R to the fourth power. So it's kind of a weird calculation, but one over it means it's an inverse right off the bat. So what do we really need to know? We need to know that our body utilizes this parameter to change our blood pressure very quickly and thus blood flow. So over short periods of time, our body utilizes vasoconstriction and vasodilation to change resistance, which thus changes pressure. And so if we vasoconstrict, we increase resistance, which is going to increase pressure. If we vasodilate, we decrease resistance and we decrease pressure. So this is the one that's the most important. So let's go over our reflex then for that. So in this chapter, I also want you to know these receptors. This is a, re a review from chapter 20. Um, I'm going to talk about the baroreceptors in a second, but you still need to know what the proprioreceptors and the chemoreceptors do. So if you forgot that, you need to go back and review that. All right. But basically, these receptors always monitor their conditions and send that information to the control center, the CV center in the medulla. 
the medulla then makes the determination as to whether or not we need sympathetic output to increase uh, blood flow and blood pressure and all of that, or if we need parasympathetic output to decrease our pressure and cardiac output. So this is a review from chapter 20. So some of you confused this a little bit that I saw on a couple of those questions. Um, so I'll just say it again. Any one of these conditions that change, is your body moving? Is your blood pressure changing? Is the chemistry of the blood changing? <coughs> Excuse me. And any one of these conditions that actually tell the CV center that you're working out, then we would want sympathetic output because we need to increase blood flow to the muscles. If for instance, let's say the one we're about to do, the bar receptive reflex. If the bar receptors, which are monitoring blood pressure, tell the CV center that your blood pressure is falling, then we always want sympathetic output because sympathetic output is gonna increase everything about your blood pressure. It increases your cardiac output. It also increases resistance. <coughs> Excuse me, through vasoconstriction. We need some water. All right, so some students confuse that. So if we ever need to increase pressure, you always want sympathetic. If for some reason though, our pressures are too high, the CV center will always want parasympathetic output. That will decrease your heart rate. So parasympathetic output goes to your SA and AV node only. The blood vessels in the body don't receive parasympathetic output. So this basically decreases your cardiac output. And if you decrease cardiac output, you decrease your pressure. So again, if our pressures are too high, we get parasympathetic output, we decrease our heart rate, which decreases cardiac output, which decreases your pressure. Now this shows the specific physical route of the neurons right here from the baroreceptors. So I'll just quickly go over it. The baroreceptors monitor pressure. The ones up here at the carotid sinus, this is the carotid artery right here that would go up your neck. This would be the right one, by, by the way. There's a, in the, what's called the carotid sinus. There's bar receptors in there. Same thing in the aorta, the arch of the aorta. In the carotid arteries, the bar receptors monitor pressure to your brain. So those are always telling the CV center what the blood pressure to your brain is. Is it high? Is it low? Is it okay? The bar receptors in the aorta tell the CV center in the medulla about blood pressure that's getting to the body itself, not the head. So these receptors are firing to the CV center. These are sensory neurons up cranial nerve number nine. You learned about in AMP1. Yep, you remember it, the glossopharyngeal nerve. I knew it was on the tips of everybody's tongue. So the glossopharyngeal nerve actually is one of those cranial nerves that serves as a sensory and a motor ner uh, nerve. That means that they have sensory neurons in it and they also have motor neurons in it. So I'm not gonna redo that AMP1 stuff, but let's look at what happens. Let's say that the baroreceptor in the carotid sinus all of a sudden tells your control center, the CV center, that hey, blood pressure to the brain just fell. That means the pressure and blood flow to your brain just dropped, right? That information goes up the glossopharyngeal nerve. The CV center says, yep, blood pressure to the brain just fell. If blood pressure falls, what type of output do we need? Sympathetic. So the CV center then turns on and sends out impulses via the sympathetic nervous system. And that's what this red line is right here. This is AMP1 stuff from the autonomic nervous system. A preganglionic neuron, postganglionic neurons, we're not putting that back on the test. But you need to know that the sympathetic neurons at least release norepinephrine all over the heart. Now notice where the neurons go. They go to the pacemakers, the a SA and AV nodes, so they're gonna increase heart rate. But those neurons also go to the ventricles. 
And so norepinephrine makes the ventricles contract harder, which increases stroke volume. So sympathetic output to the heart increases two things, heart rate and stroke volume. All of that would increase your cardiac output, which would increase pressure. Now, let's look at what happens if blood pressure to the brain goes up. Yep, blood pressure to the brain's going up, probably because we're tired of hearing this lecture. A eh, little joke. Uh, so the neurons then fire to the CV center. CV center says, yep, Tom's talking too much. Pressure's high. So what type of output do we need? Parasympathetic output. If the pressure's too high, you always want parasympathetic. So the parasympathetic neuron goes to the heart via cranial nerve number 10. Cranial nerve number 10 carries, which is the vagus nerve, carries parasympathetic fibers, but look where they go. They only go to the pacemakers. That's why the parasympathetic system only affects heart rate. The parasympathetic system never affects stroke volume. There's no parasympathetic fibers that go to the ventricle, only to the pacemakers. So when the parasympathetic nervous system fires, yep, heart rate goes down, it brings cardiac output down and the pressure starts to slowly come down. So there is a negative feedback loop. Where is it at? I passed it up. Here it is. That shows the flow chart for blood pressure regulation. That's basically what I just went through. So I'm going to go through it very quickly so we can at least start getting into the next bit of material before class is over. And if any of you have to leave the room, at 1045, you can do so. I might go on just a little bit more, but you can watch the video later, all right? Um, so let's look at this negative feedback loop. Here, the, the controlled condition is blood pressure, and some stress or stimulus is decreasing the pressure. So let's say we just got up off the couch too quickly and we got lightheaded. That's called orthostatic hypotension. So the, the blood pressure to the brain falls a little bit when you stand up too quick. So let's say that's this reflex right here. So the blood pressure to the brain is falling. The bar receptors are, are monitoring the pressure and the rate at which the neurons fire to the control center start to slow down. So how does the control center know if the neurons are telling it that the pressure is high or low? That's the, that's the question. Well, the rate at which the neurons fire tells the control center if it's high or low. So if the pressure drops, the neurons fire slowly and the control center thinks that the pressure's low. So in this case, since we got up too quickly, the pressure's falling to the brain, the, they start to fire more slowly to the CV center. CV center says, yep, pressure to the brain is low. We better increase pressure. So what type of output do we need? You guessed it, sympathetic output. So we get sympathetic output to the heart via what we call cardiac accelerator nerves. Those release, that's sympathetic in nature. It speeds up heart rate, speeds up, uh, increases, I'm sorry, stroke volume, which increases cardiac output. When you increase cardiac output, you increase the blood pressure. And this loop is going to run and run and run and run until the pressure is back to normal. Negative feedback loop. Now you could reverse that. We could say, that the blood pressure is going up. If the blood pressure is going up, some stress is making it go up, those receptors cause the neurons to fire more quickly to the CV center. The CV center says, yep, blood pressure is high, we better bring it down. In order to bring pressure down, what type of output do we need? Yep, you guessed it, parasympathetic output. So we only get parasympathetic output to the heart. You never get it to the vessels. Most vessels in the body only receive sympathetic neurons. So the heart rate is going to go down with parasympathetic output, which drops cardiac output, which would bring your blood pressure back down. Now, the adrenal medulla is involved in increasing your pressure because the adrenal medulla is always stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system. So whenever your sympathetic nervous system fires, your adrenal medulla is dumping out adrenaline into your blood, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So 
sympathetic output from the nervous system is always augmented by the hormones from the adrenal medulla. And so those are the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, always increase our blood pressure. All right, so that's the pressure loop. I also put in here a chart that has a summation of hormones and sympathetic or parasympathetic stimulation. If you're in lab, we already had this. You probably reviewed it. You should re review it again. If you're not in lab, my lab, you need to go and review these chemical mediators and what effect they have on so in, in these rows. So for cardiac output, what does norepinephrine and epinephrine do? Well, it increases heart rate and contractility, which is stroke volume, which increases cardiac output. What do these hormones and signal molecules do on resistance? Well, if the, these are the hormones that bring about vasoconstriction, we increase resistance. These are the hormones that bring about vasodilation, so we decrease resistance. So I'm going to have some questions on that. So just review this, this table right here for me. All right. Now, I'm going to start into shock. The last thing physiologically we have to cover in the chapter is shock and what shock is, all right? And shock is not, ah, I'm scared, shocked. Shock is a medical condition whereby the cardiovascular system, specifically something dealing with either the vessels or the heart, is not sending blood appropriately to the tissues in the body. So there's a decreased pressure and there's a decreased blood flow to the tissues in the body, which means they are not receiving the oxygen they need and they're not receiving the nutrients they need. And for that matter, they're not getting rid of their waste products effectively. If you decrease pressure and flow to tissues in the body, you're going to inhibit capillary exchange, which inhibits the cells getting what they need and for them to get rid of their waste. So that's called shock when we have a drop in pressures and blood flow. So there are four major reasons why shock can occur. Physiologically, we're going to cover number one. So let me just explain briefly what these are. Everybody knows what the first one is already. Hypovolemic shock basically is when a person's blood volume is too low. Maybe you're severely dehydrated, moderate to severe dehydration, or maybe somebody is vomiting and has diarrhea severely from being ill, or maybe somebody's got a wound and they're bleeding out and losing blood directly. Those individuals go into hypovolemic shock. There's three main stages to hypovolemic shock. I'm going to cover the compensation mechanisms to the stage one in a second. But look at these other ones. Cardiogenic shock is a shock event that is caused by a failure of the heart directly. An easy one is heart attack. If somebody is having some sort of major arrhythmia or they're in an active heart attack, they basically their body can go into shock because if the heart's not working to pump the blood to a tissue, then obviously the tissue can't get what it needs to live. <clears throat> but we also have something called vascular shock. There's a number of reasons why someone can go into vascular shock. And ultimately, all of those reasons will include some sort of a major vasodilation. So remember, if we have vasodilation, resistance in the vessel goes down. And if resistance goes down too much, it makes the blood pressure go down too much, which means blood flow goes down. So this can be caused by things that you know probably already, septic shock. You heard of septic shock. Somebody's got an infection, it moves into their blood, the, the, the bacteria start releasing toxins, and it causes sepsis. Majority of the time, that induces a major vasodilation. And if they have major vasodilation, their blood pressures fall. That's one reason why sepsis hurts us. That's not the only one, but one. Um, somebody can hit their head. If they hit their head, 
it causes the nervous system to not, the sympathetic system not to fire correctly, and it causes vasodilation. So that would be more specific, more specifically called neurogenic shock, but it would induce vasodilation. Somebody that's on drugs, certain types of drugs cause vasodilation. Um, let's say an elderly person is taking hypertensive meds. Some of those hypertensive meds are, are vasodilators, and ultimately all of them try to drop your blood pressure anyway, right? So let's say they forgot that, that they took their medication already and they take it again. They're gonna have a double drop in blood pressure. That's bad. Obstructive shock is the easiest one out of these because basically it is exactly what the name implies. It is when the blood vessels are being blocked up by something. So if you have a blockage, say in a coronary artery, you're gonna have a heart attack you're blocking blood from going through the coronary artery. If you have a blockage in a blood vessel going to the brain, you're gonna have a stroke. So that's obstructive shock. So let me go over stage one of hypovolemic shock, and then I'm only gonna do this once. We're gonna, I'll probably recap on this before we start the blood next time. I know you're tired and I'm over already uh, two or three minutes. But nonetheless, <clears throat> when somebody is in stage one of hypovolemic shock, stage one is called compensated shock or non-progressive. So everybody has experienced stage one of hypovolemic shock. <clears throat> it is where you lose up to 10% of your blood volume or within there and it, ha it can happen because you're, you're sweating outside in the dead of heat of summer. And then all you want to do is drink water. You don't want to go get a Coke or a Sprite or something like that. You just want plain water. If you've ever been dehydrated and you just want to suck down water, it means you're in stage one. And so when we're in stage one of hypovolemic shock, it's called compensated because we, did, we lost some volume, but we didn't lose enough to really hurt us yet, as long as our compensation mechanisms are employed. What you're looking at on the screen is the homeostatic feedback loop of three major compensation mechanisms that will be activated in order to bring your blood pressure and or your blood volume back to normal, or at least maintain it where it's at so that it doesn't drop anymore. So, so let's go through it. Some stress or stimulus, dehydration, <coughs> made you lose some blood volume, you're dehydrated, and thus your blood pressure drops. And so that's, again, remember blood volume and pressure is directly related. So if our volume goes down, our pressure goes down. So look at what our receptors are. We have receptors in the kidney, basically special cells called juxtaglomerular cells that are sensitive to low blood pressure. And when they respond to a drop in blood pressure, they release renin. Renin activates angiotensinogen, which comes from the liver, into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted by an enzyme in the lungs called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme into angiotensin 2. So if you forgot or you didn't learn the activation of angiotensin 2, you need to learn it. We covered it in chapter 20. Mentioned it in chapter 18. So ultimately this involves the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the most important hormonal regulator of blood pressure in our body. So it goes without saying that if our blood pressure drops, we want the renin angiotensin aldosterone system activated. So when we get angiotensin II out, it actually causes the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Aldosterone tells the kidney to reabsorb salt, which then causes for the reabsorption of water, which increases blood volume and thus increases your pressure. So when you're dehydrated, your kidneys are told not to lose water in urine. 
That's why I don't know if you ever notice when you're really, really hot or when you're very, very active and your body temperatures, if, if, when you're hot, you don't have to go to the bathroom as much because your kidneys are being told, hey, let's save all the water we can and put it back in the blood. So your kidneys actually decrease urinary output volume. So that's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. But we also have the baroreceptors that we just covered. So look at what happens when the baroreceptors fire because your blood pressure is dropping. Volume drops, pressure drops. The baroreceptors actually go to two places. Some of the neurons go to the hypothalamus, which causes those neurosecretory cells to release ADH. So when we're dehydrated and our blood pressure is low, ADH is going to be released. ADH tells the kidneys to reabsorb water, which increases blood volume and increases blood pressure. ADH is also a vasoconstrictor. Oh, along with angiotensin II, I forgot to mention that one. So angiotensin II and ADH also cause vasoconstriction. If you vasoconstrict, you increase resistance, which increases pressure. The bar receptors also tell the cardiovascular center in the uh, medulla oblongata, hey, blood pressure is low. So if the pressure is low, what type of output do we need? Well, you guessed it, sympathetic output. So if we get sympathetic output, what happens in the body? Well, lo a lot of blood vessels are going to vasoconstrict with sympathetic output. And if you vasoconstrict, you increase resistance, which increases pressure. We also have an output, sympathetic output from the medulla, the CV center in the medulla to the heart. Sympathetic stimulation to the heart increases both heart rate and stroke volume. If you increase heart rate and stroke volume, you increase cardiac output, which increases blood pressure. So these are the compensation mechanisms of stage one of hypovolemic shock. All right. Now, also, I just want to mention this. I put in here the signs and symptoms of someone that's in shock. You might know some of these already. Um, just review them. You know, you, you might be surprised, or unless you don't know anything about hypovolemic shock, then you don't know them. So just review this and, and know... Uh, these signs of shock for me. I put an animation in here about the homeostasis of blood pressure. This is kind of a generic uh, animation, but it's still pretty good. But also this last slide in the packet, you don't have to go memorize these numbers. This is just a table I like to put in here to show people what is normal blood pressure? What is considered prehypertensive or stage one or stage two hypertension? So now you can see what the blood pressure ranges are for sta uh, a stage one or stage two hypertension. But I'm, I'm not gonna make, I'm not gonna put a question on the test. True or false, stage one is the diastolic value bigger, higher than 100. I'm not gonna say that. But you can see in stage two, this is severe. If your bottom number is 100, that is really bad, right? So a lot of people have high blood pressure, but they feel okay, and they just don't go to the doctor. You really need to get that treated with medication. All right, so that's it for this lab. Let me stop sharing the screen. I mean, this lecture. And I'm going to stop this recording.